We have built a telescope so powerful it can look back in time, almost to the beginning of when time first started. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, a $10 billion instrument now positioned 1 million miles away from Earth that may be one of the most advanced pieces of technology the human race has ever created. The Milky Way galaxy is in fact one of billions, perhaps hundreds of billions of galaxies notable neither in mass nor in brightness nor in how its stars are configured and arrayed. Some modern deep sky photographs show more galaxies beyond the Milky Way than stars within the Milky Way. Every one of them is an island universe containing perhaps a hundred billion suns. Such an image is a profound sermon on humility. The James Webb Telescope is an amazing piece of technology and the optical physicist in me wanted to dig a little bit deeper into what's actually happening here and how does it work. I want to break this into three parts. Part one, how do you look back in time with a telescope? Part two, how does the James Webb Telescope actually work? And part three, what are we hoping to learn from it? This is going to be a bit of a deep dive, so let's start with the big one. How do you look back in time using a telescope? If a flash of light is emitted by an object, it radiates out from this object at the speed of light, approximately 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. In a year, light travels a light year, which is a measure of distance. After one year, that light will be one light year away. After two years, two light years away, and so on. If we have a telescope and are looking at that object two light years away, when we finally do see that flash, we know that we're looking at something that happened on that planet two years ago. We are staring into the past. We've built incredibly complex models of how the universe evolved after the Big Bang. Now imagine what we could learn if we actually could watch those first stars in the universe forming, about 100 to 400 million years after the Big Bang happened. Locally, we've missed out on that chance to watch this happen. As for our nearby stars, that light has already propagated and passed us by. But for the first generation of stars that were forming 13.5 billion light years away from us, their light is just reaching us now, and we could watch those first stars form. But how does the James Webb Space Telescope propose to actually capture this distant light, and why couldn't we see it already? The James Webb Space Telescope's primary mirror consists of 18 hexagonal mirror segments made of gold-plated beryllium, which combined create a 6.5 meter or 21 foot diameter mirror, compared to Hubble's, our next most powerful telescopes, measly 2.4 meter diameter. This gives the Webb Telescope a light collecting area of about 25 square meters, which is about six times that of Hubble, allowing it to see objects about 100 times fainter. Unlike the Hubble Telescope, which observes in the near ultraviolet, the visible and the near infrared spectrum from about 0.1 to 1.7 micron, the James Webb Space Telescope will observe in a lower frequency range, 600 nanometers to 28 microns. But why is the James Webb looking in the infrared rather than in the visible light spectrum? Well, because we live in an expanding universe. And as that universe expands, light that started out maybe as blue becomes stretched by that expansion, increasing its wavelength or red shifting it, changing the color of the light. As a simplified example, say we looked at a star and broke its light into a spectrum using a prism, and that light spanned the visible spectrum from blue to red. Stretching this spectrum as it travels across the universe moves this light into the infrared spectrum. How much it's moved into the red is proportional to how long it's been traveling for, or how far away that source was. This means that astronomers can define how far away something is by how redshifted it's become. We use the letter Z or Z to signify redshift. This is a measure of how old that light is or how long it's been traveling for. For example, the earliest stars are thought to have formed between 100 to 180 million years after the Big Bang. That corresponds to a redshift between Z equals 30 to z equals 20. The first proper galaxies may have formed around a redshift of z equals 15, about 270 million years in cosmic time after the Big Bang. The Hubble telescope's maximum distance that it can resolve is back to about z equals 11, but the JWST is aiming to look back all the way to z equals 20, around that earliest star formation activity. The fact that the universe is expanding and causing this redshift actually helps us, because light that's in the infrared is much less 
less likely to be affected or scattered by clouds of dust or gas in the universe. The further into the infrared that we look, the clearer our images of that early universe will become. Achieving that detection capability comes down to the two prominent features of the James Webb Telescope, its huge primary collecting mirror and the large solar shield at its back. The primary mirror is made of a beryllium substrate plated in gold. Beryllium is a stiff, lightweight metal that maintains its stable shape even at extremely low temperatures. The metal is also tough enough to withstand collisions with tiny particles in space called micrometeoroids. Although beryllium is much easier to break than something like steel, it's significantly harder to bend or deform. Its stiffness is about six times that of steel, and this is really important in a telescope because it stops that telescope from warping or deforming the primary mirror in the cold of space, as this would distort the images that the telescope was trying to collect. However, beryllium isn't reflective, so the material needs to be coated with something like gold to act as a reflector. Gold isn't the best reflector of visible light, but it's extremely good at reflecting the infrared spectra. And also, as the material is non-reactive, it won't tarnish during operation. The layer of gold applied to the 25 square meter area of the James Webb Space Telescope's primary mirror was just 0.1 microns in thickness. In total, it amounted to about one golf ball size worth of gold, or about 48 grams of gold. Using these materials, the James Webb Space Telescope's primary mirror is less than half the weight of Hubble's five meter glass collector, even though the James Webb is about five times larger. That size is important. The light collected from these stars was emitted uniformly in all directions about 13.5 billion years ago and has expanded outwards ever since. So these objects are going to be incredibly faint. Even with the 25 square meter collector, the James Webb Telescope will only collect about one photon per second from some of the most distant stars, meaning it needs to observe for many hours at a time to collect a single image. This places a huge emphasis on having stiff mirrors that don't flex or bend or warp over time, and having very precise micromotors that will enable control of the position of all of these independent mirrors to less than a wavelength of light. What further complicates these measurements is that the infrared light that the JWST is searching for is heat. All warm objects are constantly emitting light in the infrared or IR. This is ultimately what heat vision cameras detect. The JWST is essentially a heat vision telescope, sensitive enough to detect the heat from a bumblebee at the distance of the moon. So in order to make these observations in the infrared spectrum, the telescope must be kept extremely cold, below 50 degrees Kelvin, in order to observe these incredibly faint signals in the infrared. To facilitate these measurements, the James Webb is deployed in a solar orbit near the Sun-Earth L2 Lagrange point about 1.5 million kilometers or 1 million miles away from the Earth. The James Webb is further shielded from the heat of the sun or the reflected light from the Earth or from the moon by a five layer heat shield. Otherwise, the infrared radiation from the heat of the telescope itself would overwhelm its sensitive instruments. The 21 meter long, 14 meter wide, five layer sun shield is constructed from Kapton, a commercially available plastic film where each layer is as thin as a human hair. Each membrane is specially coated with aluminium on both sides, and a layer of doped silicon is added to the sun-facing side of the hottest two layers to reflect the sun's heat back into space. This is what gives the outer surfaces their pinkish color. To always have the sun, earth, and moon at its back behind the shield, JWST operates in a halo orbit, circling around that L2 point, keeping it out of both the earth and the moon's shadow. This is what allows the solar panels to operate. Combined with its wide shadow avoiding orbit, the telescope can simultaneously block incoming heat and light from all three of these bodies and avoid even the smallest changes of temperatures from the Earth and Moon's shadows that would affect the structure. Positioning at L2 also allows the telescope to remain in direct and constant communication with Earth. There's a small caveat to that point, which I think is interesting. The JWST actually sits slightly below L2, as the telescope only has thrusters on the sun shield side, and L2 is a gravitational saddle point. So it's better to sit below that point and thrust towards L2, rather than to sit exactly on the L2 point and risk potentially floating off into space. What are we hoping to learn from it? The JWST is geared to long wavelength faint signal detection. 
It has four core pieces of equipment on board, the NER cam, the NER spec, the MIRI, as well as the FGS, the fine guidance system that provides adaptive optics and image stabilization to help the telescope focus on targets. And I've got to admit here, I'm a little bit disappointed. Usually when it comes to scientific instrumentation, you get fun names to play with, things like BFG or Big Friendly Gun. Uh, here, I think we phoned it in maybe a little bit, but that's beside the point. NERCAM, the Near Infrared Camera, is the primary imager, measuring from 600 nanometers up to 5 micron in wavelength. It will look at light from the very first stars, and both it and MIRI have chronographs to block out bright stars and allow for the study of faint planets that might be orbiting these stars that may potentially be habitable or maybe even contain our first glimpses of life in the universe. Near spec or the near infrared spectrograph will allow spectral measurements to help us understand things like galaxy formation and evolution studies, the characterization of stellar populations, and of exoplanet atmospheres using transit measurements. To take these observations though will require significant observation times as the signals are particularly faint. Some estimates I've seen have measurements lasting hundreds of hours long. To allow the JST to measure multiple objects in the sky at once, it has an onboard micro shutter system consisting of 250,000 shutters that can run many studies simultaneously. The final piece of equipment, MIRI, is the mid infrared instrument and will measure the mid to long infrared wavelengths from 5 to 27 micron. Because MIRI looks at even longer wavelengths, its temperature must not be allowed to exceed more than 6 Kelvin, so it's actively cooled by a helium gas mechanical cooler sighted on the warm side of the environmental shield. Looking at these longer wavelengths, MIRI will be able to see the light of stars and planets through thick dusts of cloud that other instruments otherwise wouldn't be able to penetrate. The James Webb is still getting up and running, but has just released the first 10 images showing that all its systems are operational. What's to come over the next 10 years of use for the JWST is the deepest we have ever looked into our universe. Potentially, we'll see how the first stars were formed. We may even see the first glimpses of the chemical signatures left by life existing on a planet somewhere in the universe. The James Webb Space Telescope is a huge step forward in our ability to start probing the earliest periods of our universe's formation. I always like to reflect on the circularity of what it is that we're actually achieving here. The elements and atoms that make us up were formed in the hearts of the stars themselves. We are a manifestation of the universe, becoming self-aware and starting to observe itself. I think that's pretty neat. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.